Good evening, and welcome to the historic Coolidge Auditorium at the Library of Congress. My name is Nicholas Brown, and I am one of the producers of Library of Congress Biblio Discotheque. We are, woo! <laughs> we are so thrilled to have you with us this evening for Tim Gunn on Disco Fashion, which is being broadcast live on Facebook and YouTube. So wave to everyone that's out there. The library's disco series is an unprecedented exploration of disco music, fashion, and dance culture in the collections of our national library. Popular culture is richly represented in the library's general and special collections ranging from copyright deposits of hit songs to braille editions of sheet music, audio recordings, music manuscripts, and feature films. We are privileged to be joined throughout the week by leading scholars, industry experts, and performers to develop a greater appreciation for disco's development and legacy as a cultural phenomenon. As you participate in Biblio Discotheque events, we invite you to engage with the library via social media. Our hashtag this week is LC Disco, and our Twitter and Instagram handles are at Library Congress. Be sure to also visit our fabulously bedazzled giant disco ball in front of the Thomas Jefferson Building to grab a photo. This program and all Biblio Discotheque events are made possible through the generous support of private contributions to the Library of Congress. As you enjoy your time here tonight, we invite you to consider making a donation to support the library's free programs via loc.gov disco. On behalf of Dr. Carla Hayden, the 14th Librarian of Congress, it is my privilege to introduce our speakers this evening. Robert R. Newland, who will interview Mr. Gunn, is the Deputy Librarian of Congress. He has served at the library since 1975 in a variety of leadership roles, including Chief of Staff, Deputy Lab Librarian, Assistant Director of the Knowledge Services Group at the Congressional Research Service, and Director of the CRS Legislative Relations Office. Newland holds degrees from American University, the Catholic University of America, and Bridgewater College. He has served as a member of the Executive Board of the American Library Association. Tim Gunn is one of America's leading fashion experts. He is a co-host and mentor on the Emmy-winning television show Project, Project Runway. His career in fashion has included stints as Chief Creative Officer for Liz Claiborne Incorporated, Fashion Dean at Fifth and Pacific, and Chair of the Department of Fashion Design at Parsons School of Design. Also a distinguished writer, Gunn has authored several best-selling books about fashion, mentoring, and his career. And many thanks to our colleague, Kathy Woodrell, who has put together a special collections display for you this evening. And you can see some of Mr. Gunn's books out in the Coolidge lobby before you depart. Mr. Gunn has also written for Elle, People, and Fortune magazines, and is interviewed regularly for publications such as the New York Times, Marie Claire, and Entertainment Weekly. Immediately following tonight's interview, Mr. Gunn will sign books in the Whitall Pavilion, which is just next door to this auditorium at the top of the stairs. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Robert Newland and Tim Gunn. <laughs> Here we go. Thank you. I'm verklempt. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you for being here. OK, time to go. No. <laughs> well, Tim, welcome to the Library of Congress. Thank you for agreeing to kick off our week of uh, Disco Biblioteca. This is quite an honor for us. I'm, I'm thrilled, Robert. I have to tell you, though, when, when I received the invitation, first of all, Library of Congress I, I'm ecstatic. I mean, I'm really rhapsodic. I mean, the whole idea of being here. But then I thought, disco fashion? <laughs> <laughs> what? It's, but then I thought, the Library of Congress has everything, and you do. So why not? It's true. We do. We are, we are ground zero for uh, information about the disco era, music, uh, fashion, as yes. you can see, a little, a little bit of everything. Takes me back. Well, <laughs> it's also fun because you are a fellow Washingtonian. I am, five generations. That is, 
And a graduate of, of Corcoran yes. in sculpture. And I taught there as well for five years. So tell us, how, how did you morph from Corcoran sculpture major to star of Project Runway? Oh, dear. Yeah. Robert, how much time do we have? As much as you want. Well, I mean, I, I am always talking about life's serendipitous path. I mean, even getting to the Corcoran was a serendipitous path for me. I already had another undergraduate degree didn't know what I was going to do with a degree in literature. Um, I'd studied architecture, which I, I'd always wanted to be an architect. And I studied architecture when I first went off to college. And after one semester of it, I thought, this is a sure trip to an insane asylum. Um, <laughs> it was before CAD. So you can only imagine pulling India ink in a stylus along a straight edge, and then 20 hours into a drawing, the whole thing bleeds. Um, I. Uh, Graduated from the Corcoran, and what's interesting about the architecture is, how was I going to support myself as a starving sculptor? I built architectural models for th three firms in Washington, and, oh. and uh, so I went right back to it in a manner of speaking, but from a different point of departure. Um, and I began, I was invited to teach at the Corcoran, and that was a huge honor, and it was also another quick trip to an insane asylum. My first week there, <laughs> I threw up every single morning in the parking lot. Oh. And I had a wonderful mentor uh, who had hired me. Her name is Rona Slade, um, a wonderful Welsh woman. And d during the week, I kept rehearsing the talk I needed to have with her on that Friday afternoon after class because I thought, I've got to get out of this. I can't do this. And I was called in at the last minute because someone else decided that they were could not return to teach. So I rehearsed this wonderful, impassioned speech about how this was totally disabling me. I couldn't go on like this. I wasn't eating, I wasn't sleeping, and life didn't matter anymore. So Rona listens to this and she says to me, well, I trust that this will either kill you or cure you. And I'm counting on the latter, good day. <laughs> so, I thought, oh no, no, I've got to go back on Monday. <laughs> but cure me, it did, and I ended up being a, a career academic. I mean, 29 years in the classroom. So I was invited to, um, to teach at Parsons School of Design in New York. And I said, this was in 1982, and I said, no, 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 thank you. I love Washington, I'm very happy, I had a great relationship, um, and I, and there were lots of things that were happening for me. And it's very interesting how much life can change in as quickly as eight or nine months. Things change quite dramatically. And I didn't know where I was going to go or what I was going to do. And, um, and the old, well, the phone rang in the olden days with the ring ring. Um, <laughs> And it was Parsons asking, well, we really, we're trying again. And I said, well, I'll come up and interview and we'll see. And two weeks later, I was living in New York and that was wow. 34 years ago. Wow. So it's been a, a long ride. Now, I had another role at Parsons, or eventually did, but in 1990, I was appointed associate dean. And in that capacity, I worked with departments with curricular development and faculty hirings and full-time faculty hirings and chair hirings. Um, but most of it was cleanup. Um, I, people called me a Mr. Fix-It, and I called myself a pooper scooper. <laughs> and I would say, this place has to stop pooping so much. And it was, and that's how I landed in the fashion department. I never, people say, when did you um, fall in love with fashion? Well. I, it was with a bayonet in my back. Um, <laughs> I never intended to be part of the fashion world in, in, in any capacity. We had a crisis of leadership in our fashion program, which at the time, well, it still is. I would say it's the, arguably, arguably the most famous program at Parsons. Um, we had a crisis of leadership. I was sent in to conduct a search for the new chair. And when I would started my excavation of issues, I went back to the dean and said, this is not a quick fix and it's not something that an outsider can do. And he said, well, 
I want you to go in for a year. So that was the deal. I would be there for a year. And the limits to uh, the year were the following. I, I went in in August. The budget is set July 1st. The curriculum set. Faculty contracts are set. Room assignments. I mean, everything is laid out for you for the, for the coming year. So there's really nothing you can do except observe and probe. I asked millions and millions of questions. So after about three months there, I wrote a State of the Union of sorts to the dean saying, this place is hemorrhaging. This is not a quick fix. It's much worse than I ever dreamed. And in fact, calling it a Department of Fashion Design is a grandiosity. It's a dressmaking school. I mean, it really was. Wow. There, was no, there was no talk about conceptual development. There was no fashion history. I asked, how can this be? Oh, we don't want the students to be influenced. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? So bury yourself in a basement and pretend that yeah. fashion hasn't been around for millennia. Um, and there was nothing digital. I mean, it, it's the year 2000. So um, I'll fast forward. I ended up being appointed chair, which was nothing I intended to do, though I do have to tell you a funny story. A dear friend of mine for, for many years, um, it's, it's Diane von Furstenberg, and <laughs> she's really a doll. Yeah. She, um, she was always my go-to person for any kind of real dilemma because she's a fantastic problem solver and she knows how to write the ask, uh, write, ask the right quest, questions and, and she knows how to diagnose and prescribe. Um, so she was meeting with me in my new office as chair and I was very aware just in terms of aura that something was very different. So I looked at her and I said, what's the matter? And she looked me up and down and she said, you need new clothes. <laughs> she said, you cannot be running this department looking like this. I said, it's that bad? She said, it always has been. I just never ne had a need to tell you. <laughs> What a great piece of advice, I love it. <laughs> but I have to tell you another funny story having to do with Diane. I'm sorry, I'm straying. I have this elliptical way of talking. No, um, please go on, I love it. Once I was appointed chair, I had certain things that I had to do. I mean, the curriculum was, was a huge one, faculty issues were another. There was a very powerful faculty member who, and I say powerful because he um, asserted himself into everything and he did so very inappropriately. Um, but it had been going on for years, so in many ways the precedent had been set and then who's to say to him, you cannot do the following things. Um, and I thought, well, I'm the one who's gonna say it. But I, had, I couldn't actually fire him. I mean, I could have, but I knew politically it would be very dangerous, so I thought, I need to get this guy to quit. So <laughs> I wrote him a, a very matter-of-fact letter just laying out, here are your responsibilities, and here are the things you've been doing that you will no, no longer be doing. And sent it, was waiting for the repercussions, and within about 10 days, this enormous, I mean enormous envelope arrived. And it was hard, I mean you couldn't really you couldn't bend it. I thought, what is this? Well, this individual was, was an extremely talented artist. I pull out this document that looks like a medieval manuscript. I mean, it was spectacularly stunning with gold leaf and <laughs> dragons. Oh and I read it, yes. and it began with, I receive your menacing missive. <laughs> And it concluded with, I quit. <laughs> I was thrilled. Wow. So, a, a few weeks later, Diane was in the office, and I was very lucky to have my own little private restroom in my office. So, I took this thing, this document, and hung it behind the bathroom door, <laughs> which, when closed, faces the toilet. Yes. <laughs> So Diane's in the bathroom and she calls out, what's a menacing missive? <laughs> so do, anyway. you, do you still have it? 
Of course. That's great. Well, but so when I was chair of the fashion department, the producers of Project Runway called, and I, I made, and I'll say this immodestly, but also um, uh, rather, what's the word I'm searching for? Um, well, I'll, I'll just say, I'll say this immodestly. I had to make meteoric changes in that department, and they were very c controversial in many cases, and many people in the industry, particularly our alumni, hated me. I mean, we're real, I was very unpopular because I took this, this um, precious thing, this fashion design department that hadn't changed in 52 years and turned it upside down. Um, my predecessors as, as, as chair had been keepers of the flame, so to speak, and I blew the flame out. And for that, I, yeah. was, I was maligned. Yeah. Um, but the producers heard a lot of talk about me, and the people said, you should go talk to him, because he's made a lot of changes. They, in the end, were very good, um, and maybe he can help you with this project. So they called me, and I said, I'll tell you exactly what I said. I said, fashion reality. I said, this, this industry has enough trouble without that. <laughs> <laughs> so they asked if they could come meet with me, and you know, of course, and I Googled them um, and found out that they were the producers of Project Greenlight, which has a lot of integrity and seriousness of purpose. Um, and they met with me, and I became very excited. They wanted to work with real fashion designers, and it sounded, um, it sounded interesting and fun. Um, but they asked me a question that I knew was the question, so to speak, and it was the following. How would you respond if we were to tell you that we want the designers to create a wedding dress in, in two days? Well, to, compared to Project Runway today, two days sounds like an eternity. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I'm, I mean, I come from the academic world, and in design, we have charrettes in architecture where you get a project on Friday night and you're critiquing it on Sunday. I was very matter of fact. I said, they'll have to create a wedding dress in two days. So it can be done. Well, it can be done. It's not going to be an Oscar de la Renta or a Vera Wang gown, but it, it'll be a shift without sleeves. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, but it can be done. Well, actually, a ship doesn't have sleeves. I think I said yeah. it'll, it will be a column without sleeves. Yeah. Um, and then I didn't hear from them for weeks. And I thought, well, that was interesting. And they went, went elsewhere. And then they called. And I was their consultant up until two days before the designers arrived. Well, I'm, in a way, I'm still their consultant. Um, but two days before the designers arrived, they asked me if I would go into the workroom and, and pummel the designers with questions about what they're doing. And I thought, well, that's how I've spent most of my life. Yeah. So, sure. Um, but Robert, I told you backstage, I never dreamed I'd be in the cut of the show. I thought as long as they have the, the designers responding to me, no one needs to hear my voice, no one needs to see me. Um, and for that reason, I didn't go to the premiere party. I thought, well, if I'm in the show, what will I look like and sound like? And if I'm not in the show, I'll be kind of humiliated. Um, so I watched the, the, the premiere um, on television. I watched it from uh, the same way I used to watch The Wizard of Oz. I was in bed peeking out from behind my sheets. <laughs> because I honestly didn't, I hadn't seen anything in advance and I thought, I don't know what they're going to show. Maybe it's sexual escapades in the Atlas Apartments. I have no idea. Um, and I'll add, the first, the, the first five seasons of the show, we were on Bravo, and during the taping of that first season, um, there was a woman standing next to me in the darkness of the back of the, of the Parsons Auditorium where we filmed the um, runway show and the Q&A with the designers and the judges' deliberation. And we were watching the judge's deliberation, and this person, unknown to me, turned to me and asked, who's going to want to watch this? <laughs> and the person was the president of Bravo. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, who, who knew? I mean, it's, I, 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 and also at age 50, I had an entirely new threshold to my life. I mean, it was phenomenal. And I had a very happy, very um, rewarding, spiritually, career. So over the course of, uh, 
Project Runway. How have you changed as, as uh, one who critiques design, as a teacher, as a mentor? That's an interesting question. Well, actually, becoming a mentor was very challenging in, a, in ways that I didn't think that it would because I became aware very quickly that I, I had to take off my teacher's hat. And, and actually, it happened episode one season, or season one episode one. I was in the sewing room threading a bobbin. And because one of the designers was having difficulty doing it. So Jane Lipsitz, one of the executive producers, is suddenly knocking, because she has a feed, a little visual feed to every room, It's knocking on the sewing room door saying, Tim, can I speak to you in the hallway? <laughs> so I went out in the hallway, she said, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, I'm threading a bobbin. She said, you can't do that. Why not? Because it's a fairness issue. If you thread the bobbin for that designer, you have to thread the bobbin for all the other designers. <laughs> and I said, I'm out of the sewing room. Yeah. Yeah, right. I'm not gonna become the bobbin threading handmaiden. <laughs> so, I, and I also learned during the, the critiques, and, and actually I've been like this, I, where the, the, the mentor you see in, in the workroom is very much the way that I evolved as a teacher, because in the early days of teaching, I think it's somewhat natural for at, at least novices to want to make their students into little mini-me's. Um, I want you to have the same, I mean, and not aesthetically, but in terms of of uh, discipline uh, or self-discipline and uh, work habits and uh, all of the myriad things that go with that, punctuality and break time and not having liquids in the studio and various things. And then I just, but it, what I evolved to was, what are you trying to do? And how well are you succeeding at this? What issues are you having? So I developed a very Socratic approach to teaching, which is pummeling people with questions. The, the other, I'll, I'll say this for any teachers or would-be teachers in this room, the other thing that I just rid myself of, which was really the debilitating throwing up part of it, was <laughs> feeling that I was responsible for every kernel of information, that I had to be this, this uh, wunderkind uh, answer man. And it was just, it was, it was debilitating. So, what I evolved to was if someone were to ask a question, a student were to ask a question, I would say, interesting question. For, next, for the next class, I want all of you to research this question <laughs> and come in with an answer that you don't think anyone else would have found. Oh. So oh, they I, had to dig deep, and then that. we'd share it all. And it was fantastic, it, it, because that, the conversation that would uh, evolve from that one question would be a catalyst for a million other things. And it would take us in directions that even I hadn't anticipated. And it was a huge enhancement to the course syllabus. So for me to move into the mentor position on runway was, I mean, I would say it was easy. I was a nervous wreck. Sure. Um, I was especially a nervous wreck if Heidi was ever around. My palms would sweat. <laughs> um, <laughs> She's very, I mean, she's a lovely, fantastic person whom I love dearly, but she's Heidi Klum. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big. It's, it's so. Yeah, it can be very intimidating, I'm sure. But it was, um, it was a journey right. and one that I've really loved. So what, what is it like actually doing Project Runway? How long does it take you to do it? Um, well, we did the bulk of it, um, which consists of 12 challenges uh, in 31 days. Um, wow. Yes, we have no breaks. We have 18 hour, sometimes 20 hour days. I was also telling Robert, I love Project Runway Junior because we have to abide by the child labor laws. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a vacation. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> It's so wonderful. The day ends, pow, we, everyone's off the clock. The crew loves it too, but with runway, I mean, if, if it's decided that the workroom's gonna stay open until, from, it's not gonna close at 12, we're gonna stay open until two, I mean, we share it with the audience. We don't, we never misrepresent things, but then I'm, then I'm there until two o'clock, which is fine. It's a high class problem. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But they're long days. And, and I will say, 
um, it gets to all of us. I mean, it's, it's, it's a cumulative exhaustion, mentally, physically, creatively, it's, it gets to us, but I wouldn't not do it. And, and it's for budget reasons that we do it in such a short sure. period of time. Right. But then there's a hi hiatus. I then do the home visits, which take about 10 days, including travel. And then there's a, another very small hiatus, and then we have Fashion Week, which takes us five days beginning to end. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, one of the reasons we're here is to celebrate disco, the whole disco era, and we are both products of that, of that era. Regrettably. Yeah. There, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think defines disco in terms of fashion? Well, I, I want to give it a bit of a context. Um, we're coming out of the 1960s which was, in my view, the most revolutionary decade in fashion ever. I mean, we usher it in with mad men, primness, and buttoned-upness for men, um, and we usher it out with hippies. I mean, and in between we've had the clear, the clear vinyl dress, courtesy of YSL, we've had the paper dress, right. um, We've had, I mean, that's why today, especially with those, oh God, those horrible Kardashians running around. I mean, <laughs> I, <laughs> I'll be honest with you, the only thing that makes my bile rise more is what's going on in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> But, but truly, after the 60s, fashion-wise, I'm pretty unshockable. Um, so we have this, this turmoil. We enter into the 70s, and there are certain aspects of it that are, that are brought in. Uh, we had a, had, a, had a peacock a movement with men in the 60s of, of extravagant dress. It m melded beautifully into the whole disco movement. Um, we had uh, a kind of body awareness with women where, where very little was left to the imagination. And that certainly uh, segued very beautifully into disco because it was a time of flamboyance. It was a time of, of um, differentiation and that everyone wanted to stand out. I'm always talking about the semiotics of clothes. The clothes we wear send a message about how the world perceives us. And you wanted to be distinctive and different on that disco dance floor. I mean, it was really a giant runway of sorts. Um, and it was sexually charged, sociologically charged, identity charged. Um, there were, there were uh, gender bending aspects to, to disco culture. Um, and we see the rise of uh, certain designers uh, in that period who, who also uh, were inextricable from the whole disco movement. I mean, Halston being probably the most prominent. And part of it had to do that, with the fact that he was working with Jersey, which has stretch. So how easy would it be to go crazy on the dance floor wearing Halston? And people did, Liza Minnelli being his most famous client. Um, Diane von, per von Furstenberg, another. Um, and uh, Norma Kamali, um, all uh, deeply uh, iconic in the 70s and, and, and entrenched in disco culture. So it was a, it w it was a phenomenal time. Uh, and it's, ar it's debatable but, and, and arguable, but many people say that disco culture came out of um, uh, a, a gay subculture. Um, and, and I believe that, in many ways it did. And, and coincidentally, I'm sure most of you are entirely too young to have any awareness of this, and, but in some ways I think you should. In 1973, homosexuality was removed from the list of psychiatric di disorders by the American Medical Association. So suddenly, you didn't have to be so worried about being out because be, prior to that, you could be locked up. I mean, legally. You were no longer a deviant. Yeah, yes. So, um, 
this subculture could emerge and be, could become, I won't say mainstream, but, but actually embraced by the mainstream. I mean, the wonderful thing about disco culture is that it was all inclusive. It didn't care where you came from, who you were, what your, your identity was, what race you were, um, it, 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 it embraced everybody. Um, and it was, I mean, actually I did a little bit of research in anticipation of our interview because I thought, what do I really know about this? <laughs> um, I, I didn't realize that by 1978, in this country alone, there were 10,000 discotheques. Wow. 10,000. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah, I mean, wow. that's a staggering number. Um, and of course, the, 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 the grand poobah of them all was Studio 54. Yes, amazing. So from this period, do you have any kind of fa your own fashion recollections, things that you were wearing? Oh. Um, <laughs> is, 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 there any, is there anything in your closet you want to tell us about? <laughs> You know, I have this theory called the monkey house at the zoo, and it is the following. When you first walk into the monkey house, you shriek, this place stinks. <laughs> and after 20 minutes, you think, it doesn't smell so bad. <laughs> and after 30 minutes, you think, what smell? Yeah, right. <laughs> but anyone new walking in right. says, this place stinks. That was my 70s fashion. God. I'm sure I put on those polyester pants and the floral shirt, and I thought, this is unacceptable and atrocious. <laughs> <laughs> and after 20 minutes, I thought, you know, I look kind of hip. <laughs> <laughs> and after 30 minutes, I thought, okay, I can leave my apartment now. But looking back upon it, what were we thinking? Right. Well, Tim, I went into my closet. Oh, what did you find? <laughs> Robert, you still have them? I, Are you waiting for the return? This is, I wish I could get my foot in them. Um, <laughs> 1977, I bought them in Paris. I was studying in, Paris. in France. Yes. And I thought I was the coolest thing that ever hit the earth. Well, you were. So why do I still have these? Why do you? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. All I can say is thank God for tiny New York apartments. Yeah. Because unless I resign myself to being a hoarder, which yeah. could potentially yeah. happen, I, I, don't keep, I just can't yeah. keep things. They go. Well, you're smart. We'll I take wish. a picture. It will last longer. There, there but that's go. extraordinary. One of the things that you were telling me backstage, to, well, back to kind of your career, um, that really surprised me was that you have to have your own wardrobe for oh, the show. Oh, I do. Now, I, I, I was I imagining everything. you were just you know, sitting back, <laughs> picking out. You know, people were holding up outfits, and you were just. No, but I, you know, you've just triggered a, a story, though, that I haven't even. I, has left my mind. Year one of Project Runway, it's 2004, Banana Republic was one of the sponsors of the show. In fact, we had a Banana Republic challenge the first two years. Um, and they were going to wardrobe me, outfit me, and coincidentally, I was a big Banana Republic fan. In fact, when Diane von Furstenberg said, you've got to do something about this, um, I went off to Saks found a black leather blazer that I really loved. It was hugely expensive. It made me sick buying it. Then I walked across the street to the Banana Republic flagship at Rockefeller Center, and I remember Banana Republic back then being khakis and, um, you, you know, you're going into the Amazon. Um, <laughs> and I found the identical jacket, more or less, for 25 or for 75% less. It was a mere 25% of the price, so I bought it, took the other jacket back to Saks, but I discovered this whole world of Banana Republic and loved it, so I had a lot of the clothes, but I was thrilled that I was gonna get new stuff and they were anticipating um, when this show would be aired and it would be new fall clothes, and at any rate, 
Nothing came, nothing came, nothing came. So then some calls were made and clothes did arrive taped to a, a bicycle messenger's bike, these bags of Banana Republic clothes. But I was wearing Banana Republic every day, but it was my Banana Republic, not theirs. So I was an honest man. Yeah. So I get out the steamer, and I get out the iron, and I'm working on all these clothes. So it worked itself out. But at the end of the season, they wanted everything back, including the socks. <laughs> Oh my God. So I dry cleaned everything. I had made certain all the socks were laundered. And I was then, later, I was asked, this is a getting really tedious. I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I, I, Lauren David Peden, who wrote for Women's Wear Daily, uh, had a regular feature about giving someone $100 and you go shopping, what would you buy? So I said, oh, that's easy. There's a raincoat at Banana Republic on sale for $99. I'll pay the tax. Um, so we did that. And in the course of this interview, I told her about taking all the clothes, how they wanted all the clothes back. Well, all hell broke loose. <laughs> I mean, then don't take them back if you don't want to accept responsibility <laughs> for them. <laughs> don't take them back. I was just flabbergasted. So season two, they're the sponsors again, and now I'm, a, I'm still wearing Banana Republic, but I'm turned off by their public relations people. So I say nothing, and it was very passive aggressive of me, and at the end of the season, <laughs> the people who oversee sponsors come to me and say, we need an inventory of everything you wore this season. Why? Well, we need to credit Banana Republic with it. I said, well, I'm wearing Banana Republic, but it's all mine. What do you mean? So the clothes never came, and they didn't. Once again, all hell broke loose. <laughs> I mean, I love being a truth teller, but it really does cause some problems. <laughs> um, so at any rate, I am responsible for, for my wardrobe, and I take that role very seriously. And it means I need to get new things every year, and I take a lot of things to um, goodwill and housing works because I have small New York closets. Um, and if anyone's wondering, no, you can't write them off in your taxes. Once anything leads, leaves the studio, oh. we, and of course I'm on the subway every day, so it leaves the studio. Um, I don't have a dressing room. I don't have a place to change. So um, it's mine. But that also means I can do what I want right. with it. Oh, that's great. Well, Tim, we're going to turn in a moment just to some... Um, questions from the audience. Oh, thrilling. Which will be fun. But I have, I have two more questions that, um, that everybody really wants to know, and I, I must give them to you now. Uh oh the, the first one is, do you have a tattoo? <laughs> you know, it's something I fantasize about. <laughs> and at the moment, no, because I have a serious aversion to pain. But... If I were ever to get a tattoo, this, in, in honest truth, I've, I've said this many times, it would be my Library of Congress catalog number, one of them. Bravo. <laughs> no, honestly. <laughs> also, don't you think in a way, when you think about tattoos, and I say this with the greatest respect, that it's kind of a tattoo antidote? What is it, the li your Library of Congress catalog number? It, I think it's great. It is. I, yeah. I, I love it. This is wonderful. We're going to go places with that. I'm not <laughs> sure how yet, but we're going to go there. Um, actually, just two more things. Um, could you give us any dish on your co-stars? Could I? <laughs> <laughs> Let me put it this way. Heidi is a doll. There isn't a diva's bone in her body. And all you need to know is that every crew member adores her. Crew members do not suffer fools gladly. And then they're the other two. <laughs> <laughs> well. Now that I have to interact with them, <laughs> since season 12, I've had to sit with them for the runway show. I'm telling you, this work is coming down the runway, 
we're supposed to be looking at it. And for me, I mean, you could say, oh, I already know what the work is. No, I haven't seen it walk. I haven't seen it on models. I haven't seen how the proportions really work with the proportions of the body. I, 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 in a way, I haven't seen it walk. And the judges haven't seen it at all. At least I saw it in the workroom. I'll be sitting there studying the show, and Nina will lean over and ask, so how's your summer? <laughs> <laughs> Look at the show. <laughs> I used to say, before I interacted with them, that I would say hello to the judges when they arrived, but I frequently didn't say goodbye because I was mad. <laughs> so I still don't say goodbye, but I do say hello. That's good. That's good. Well, my, my last question is really on the serious side. Um, many of us are familiar with your very moving video on it's, it, the It Gets Better oh, project. Thank you. Thank I can you. hardly say it without getting choked up. Thank you. Really beautiful. And you've done so much work championing um, prevention of teen suicide. And how do you manage all of the charitable work that you're doing with this very demanding professional schedule? Well, I consider it a responsibility. Um, you just have to make time for it. Um, it's very, very important to give back. And uh, having spent most of my life, well, all of my life, really with, with, with young people, with uh, especially students, and knowing how painful um, navigating the world can be and, and, and growing up can be, I'm, I'm uh, a squish. I mean, I'm just a soft, have a, a soft spot for that kind of pain and anguish because I went through it myself, and I thought I would never be delivered from it. Um, and and to be able to to say to people, um, individuals, it really does get better. But I have to say this too to everyone. I mean, life is a collaboration. We do not do things alone, and we certainly don't get better alone. And I had, I was lucky to have, I didn't think I was lucky at the time, I thought it was absolutely horrible, but I was lucky to have a, a, an intervention by an incredible doctor who just wouldn't put up with my nonsense. And he saved me and stood by me. And thank I'm God. forever grateful. Thank yeah. God. So, so thank you. Well, I think we'd like to turn to some questions from the audience. I'd love it. Our staff have microphones and it's kind of bright up here, so. Um, any, any quest? Oh, lights come up. Here we go. Wow. Ready for our close-up. Can I also um, say this? We have a question right, right here. I just want to say, you're a fabulous looking audience. Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm so glad the lights went up. Where's our question? Hi. Uh, Hi. You have, I think, the best Washington D DC story I've ever heard. I was wondering if you could tell it again. It's the Vivian Vance story oh, that you have? The yes. <laughs> My father was an FBI agent for 26 years. Oh. And he um, was in a field office in Newark, New Jersey, of all places, for three of those years, and then was moved to headquarters. And my father was a very talented writer and ended up being Hoover's ghostwriter um, and speechwriter and took care of all of his correspondence. And my sister and I would visit uh, the FBI headquarters once a year and take the FBI tour. It was a real thrill, and I think it still, probably still is. Yeah. So, and, and, and remember, this is the olden days of J. Edgar Hoover, who, who was director of the FBI under five presidents. It was not a, his was not a presidential appointment. Um, in fact, I have a whole conspiracy theory about his death, death but that's another <laughs> matter. Yeah. Um, so on this one particular day, my father said to my sister and me, um, Vivian Vance is visiting Mr. Hoover. And I was a huge I Love Lucy fan. I mean, I'm a huge I Love Lucy fan. Would you like to meet her? Well, who wouldn't? I mean, I was nervous, but who wouldn't? So we, went, we met Vivian Vance. It was thrilling. It was before selfies and little portable phones and <laughs> things of that sort. So, that, so there was no documentation, but we met Vivian Vance. It was great. So years later, my father is, has passed. All this stuff comes out about Hoover being a cross-dresser. And it was Thanksgiving dinner, and I turned to my sister, and I said, remember the visit 
to Mr. Hooper's office when we met Vivian Vance, and she said yes. I said, do you think it was odd that Mr. Hoover wasn't in the office? <laughs> Wow. Put a curly fright wig on J. Edgar Hoover. It's Ethel Mertz. Wow. <laughs> so, I wrote about this in, I think it was in Guns Golden Rules, and the fact checkers, the legal department at Simon & Schuster, oh my God. checked, they, they had to go through everything, everything. And when I got to the story, they contacted um, Vivian Vance's two biographers, and there was, they knew nothing about a visit to the FBI. Then they checked the visitor logs of the FBI. Oh my gosh. That is some Washington footnote. I know. Wow. wow. But if Vivian Vance were still alive and were to visit the White House, there would still be no record. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, we have a question right here. Hi. 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 I'm Jennifer. Of all the things that you see celebrities or just people today, you know, that we wear, what is your least favorite trend? What's my least favorite? Trend today. Trend? Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to offend some people, but can I ask this question? When did the legging become a pant? <laughs> when did it happen? I mean, you know it's a classic monkey house item. Yeah. You know it is. I can't go out wearing these. <laughs> And then 30 minutes later, I look hot. <laughs> I, I don't understand it. It's a form of undergarment. Wear it under a tunic or a pair of shorts or a dress. It's not a pants. You heard it here first, Washington DC. Really? Right? Let's, okay, we have one right up here. Hi. Hi. Um, so many of the challenges on Project One Runway seem to be run by the sponsors. Oh, they are. Uh, have, you, <laughs> have you ever gotten one that you were just disgusted by? Yes, but fortunately, they don't, we, the sponsor goes away because Heidi and I say we won't do it. We just won't do it. So if you can believe it, <laughs> the ones that you do see are modified and mitigated in such a way that they actually, at least from my point of view, work. Um, though there's some exceptions. <laughs> but, but, yeah, I mean, there are times when Heidi and I were supposed to dress up as detergent bottles and present the challenge. <laughs> I said, well, as long as, we, if we do this, let's get, do it in LA and we'll go and let's make a deal. <laughs> or do it at Halloween. Oh, I love it. But, but no, you know, we couldn't do the show without the sponsors. We have such a slim budget, um, and if it weren't, I mean, there would just would be no show. So we, we did the best we can with it. That's great. A question right here. Hi, Tim Gunn. I have two questions, I'm sorry. Um, I want to know who your favorite look was at the Met Gala last night, and no, I, what your favorite bar in DC is. Last night. Well, I mean, honoring Ray Kawakuba and Comme des Garçons, um, it's really a license to wear Halloween costumes. <laughs> and a lot of people did. Um, I tended, I mean, personally, and I'm an old fuddy-duddy, um, I liked the more demure looks. I thought Jennifer Lopez looked fantastic. But was she out of step with what the theme of, the, of the, the, the show was? You know, I'm not permitted to attend the gala. I'm very proud of that. Be <laughs> <laughs> because the hostess and I, Miss Wintour, are arch enemies. <gasps> oh. oh my goodness. 
Do you not? Do you all not know this story? It, it's oh. an, it, it was an outcome of truth telling. Oh my gosh. Do you want? Do you want to hear? It's it? just you and me here. Yeah. <laughs> I was being interviewed by Robert Rourke at the New York Post for um, a cover story they were doing uh, corresponding to, the, to a premiere of Project Runway, a new season of Project Runway. And he asked me, what is the most unforgettable thing you've ever seen in fashion? Uh, he said, I don't mean an article of clothing, but something that's happened. And I said, oh, that's easy. I said, I was watching Anna Wintour being carried down five flights of stairs from a fashion show. Just the facts, no editorializing, <laughs> nothing about her character, just the facts. So we printed it. Came out on Sunday, of course, and it was a little box. And I was teaching the following Monday morning. I get back to my office, so I, this is Parsons, of course, and <laughs> I, I wish I could recreate my expression and movements. There is a, while you were out, little post-it things that are also like <laughs> old dinosaurs. Anna went to his office called, please return. <laughs> well, I w was, uh, I think every orifice opened. <laughs> <laughs> so I called, actually I didn't call right away. I thought, when will she probably be at lunch? <laughs> Yeah. So intuitively, I thought, 1.30. So I called, and she was at lunch. So I thought, okay, deed yeah. done. <laughs> However, someone else picked up the phone after a, being on hold for a few seconds, named Patrick McConnell. He was the, the director of communications for Vogue. And he said, Miss Winter demands a retraction. Of what, I asked. <laughs> he, she demands that you call the post and have them print a retraction. And I said, but that would imply that it's not true. Well, it's not true. I said, it is true. <laughs> and this had happened a couple of years before, and I, I keep all my appointment diaries. So I knew it was September 12th. It was um, Peter Somm's show. It was the Metropolitan Pavilion, which is why I was on the fifth floor. So here's the context. The Metropolitan Pavilion is an old industrial building. There's one big freight elevator, and it's well known that Miss Wintour will not ride in an elevator with mere mortals. So she is in alone with her security detail. So we were, my colleagues and I, who were going to the Peter Somm show, were speculating not how she would arrive. That could be easily facilitated. Get her in alone, get her up but how she would descend, because it's a frantic mad rush. You've got to leave that, that location and get to the next location for the next show. So we were standing. I'm ha always happy to stand at a fashion show. And we, had, we were directly opposite Anna Wintour. And she had her two huge bodyguards on each side of her. Um, so we thought, what's going to happen when the, when the lights come on? Well. We ran out behind them, and there was a big, giant open staircase. Again, a big industrial building. And the two security people made a fireman's lock, and she sat in it. And they whooshed her down the stairs. So I ran to the window to see whether they would put her down on the sidewalk or take her to the car. <laughs> they took her to the car. <laughs> So down 18th Street, they went. So I didn't print any, I mean, I didn't say any of that, but I had in my, in my uh, uh, diary, in my, my date book, all the information that I gave to Patrick McConnell. So with each declaration of Peter Somm, Noon, Metropolitan Pavilion, he would say, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> so good day, Patrick. Yeah. So Tuesday, <laughs> Tuesday he calls again, he calls, and he said, you're going to love this, he said, I'll have you know, Miss Wintour knows how to work a Manolo. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> she, she could take those stairs 
look, I know Miss Wintour knows how to work a Manolo. It wasn't about whether she could walk down the stairs, it was speed. And these guys in their flat security shoes were going much faster than she would have ever gone on those Manolos. Once again, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> so, the following day, he calls and he says, all right, we have to get the lawyers involved. And I said, good, because this means we can't talk anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so then, you're gonna love this part even more. Yeah. A colleague of mine, I had an appointment with in my office, and he came in and he looked at me and he said, you look horrible, what's going on? So I told him the story. And he said, I was there. I saw it. He picked up the phone, he called Patrick, and he said, it's so-and-so. I would, and here's the part that you won't believe. I can't say so-and-so's name anymore because I was served papers by an attorney because Anna Wintour threatened his job because of this association with me. But anyway, he saved me. So he said, I was there, I saw it. And of course, there were probably a hundred people who said, well, probably not. There were probably 50 of us gathered around the stairwell. But she instilled such fear in people that no one would say anything. Well, she doesn't, well, yes, she does scare me. <laughs> so I decided to take the high road. I called the florist that I use. I said, I want an enormously, staggeringly beautiful, all white arrangement sent to Miss Wintour. And I, wrote my own note, took it to the floor so he would accompany this, and thought, okay, this is the right thing to do. However, I had a secret embedded message in the white flowers. <laughs> Here, and that's in Western culture, it means peace, but in Asian cultures, it means death. <laughs> Got it. How did we get off on this tangent? <laughs> well, anyway. I, I don't think we'll top that one Oh, tonight, the, the Met Gala. So I was invited when I was, Liz Claiborne, my, my boss, our CEO, um, bought a table annually. So the first year that I was there, he said, you're coming with me. And I said, I don't think I am. <laughs> and he said, don't be ridiculous. I buy a table every year and you're coming. So he put me on the list and then had to come into my office a few days later with his tail between his legs to say, I'm really sorry, but you've been an unv uninvited. Wow. Yeah, so she oh goes my. through that list. I thought, oh, I don't want to go to that thing anyway. Oh my gosh. But what was your second question? <laughs> we won't go to it. We have one last question. Hi. Hi. Wow, that's loud. Um, um, what was your favorite challenge on Project Runway? I have to say it's very sentimental for me. Season one, challenge one, when the designers were all expecting to go to a high-end fabric store and we took them to a grocery store. <laughs> and we said, okay, here's your money. Shop for all these unconventional materials. And it, it doesn't appear in the show, but um, one of my favorite moments was with Austin Scarlett, who won that challenge with that incredible um, corn husk dress. I mean, it was, yeah. it was staggering. Um, he had a shopping cart filled with, with corn, and on top of it were all these bags of potato chips. I said, I understand the corn, but what are the potato chips for? He said, for the bus ride home. <laughs> Oh my. <laughs> Tim Gunn, you are fabulous. Thank no you, Robert. question. Oh, good habits. Thank you all. You're a fabulous audience. Thank you. Really, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
I have one last thing to say to everyone. Make it work. <laughs> Should we hear that? Thank you. Thank you again.